Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar on marine engine rebuilding. My name is Amanda Goyette. I am an admin assistant here with AERA, and I will be moderating today's webinar with my colleague, Rob Monroe. Hey, everyone. Yeah, Rob Monroe here. I look after membership and technical development with AERA. And uh, what we're going to do today is you've got, we've got a real treat for you. Uh, Chris has been gathering information for over 30 years for uh, a lot of this marine information you're going to see today. So, all right, like I mentioned today, uh, this webinar loaded with great information. Chris Hammond is the president of Lakeland Auto and Marine in Port Clinton, Ohio, and he is definitely our resident expert with all things related to marine. He's the guy that we call on the tech line. When you guys got a tech question based on anything marine, it's Chris that we call. And uh, the kind of information that Chris is going to share with us today you really can't find this stuff in a technical manual. This is stuff that Chris has been gathering for years and years about marine engines. Chris, how are things going today? Hey, it looks like they're doing pretty good to me. All right, well, thanks, Rod. Thanks, Amanda. Hey, uh, my name is Chris Hammond. Um, I own Lakeland Auto Marine, and uh, we're going to do this marine engine rebuilding webinar. Uh, this is something that AERA asked me to do. Uh, we, I've got a bunch of information compiled. Um, we split it up into two parts. I had so much that I, I know we couldn't get it all done in, in one. So uh, we've got over 200, almost 200 pages here. So uh, our, our focus is going to be basically on, on GM engines and some Chrysler stuff and some nuances today. We're going to do some diagnostic uh, stuff with water intrusion, uh, water reversion uh, on part two. But just a little bit of bio about us and myself. Uh, we've been in business 34 years. We've been an AERA member and supporter since 1992. We've got 10 employees. Our, our specialty is drivability diagnostics, mostly car repair. Um, we're the old school jobber machine shop. So uh, we're the parts store uh, machine shop place that presses wheel bearings on, does all the stuff that the old school shops used to do. So we're still old school here. Um, our specialty is marine. Uh, we don't do any race. We don't go fast here. I'm slow, Chris. That's the joke. So uh, it's, it's mostly uh, 80, 80, 85% marine. I would say probably 10% industrial and the rest is automotive. So um, we rebuild carburetors and starters and alternators here. Um, and I'm an ASC master tech with advanced level certification diesel and hybrid. Um, I also a Mercury certified, Volvo certified crusader and recently started doing some training uh, for marine technicians. We started our own marine training program uh, that I develop and deliver classes. Um, if you're interested, uh, you can always email me. We have a YouTube channel. A lot, some of the stuff I'm gonna be talking about today, I have videos on our YouTube. So uh, about crankshaft neurals, all, all kinds of stuff we're gonna talk about. So just a little quick bio on me. Uh, here's this training we've been doing. I just wanna bring this up. Um, I, I realize our, our target audience today is engine builders. So you're not necessarily diagnosticians until you have to be. So um, th this here is uh, Pico. Uh, I like Pico technology. Uh, we teach how to use their lab scope, um, how to find tricky diagnostic situations. Um, we're not going to talk about much today, but we use this scope to check relative compression and cranking vacuum, for instance, on an engine. I can use a pressure transducer and I can identify whether the engine mechanically has a problem in under five minutes without taking any spark plugs out. So we use cranking vacuum patterns uh, to verify a cylinder's ability to seal and to breathe. You know, a, com a traditional compression test can only tell me if the cylinder can seal. It can't tell me if it's breathing uh, very well, if I've got restricted exhaust, if I have a cam low bore out. Uh, this is a very, very interesting technology that I love. Um, and it, it makes my life a lot easier. So if you're interested, ehovi.net, where we do this training. And you can go to Pico Auto, too, to learn more about the scope. But here's my goals and objectives for today. So what I want to talk about is the key differences between automotive and marine. You know, for years, you know, we've, we've bought, excuse me, marine manufacturers have bought engines from GM and Ford and Chrysler and, and so forth, you know, and, and way back Continental and, and Hercules uh, and, and some old stuff like that. Uh, we're going to talk just a little bit about some older stuff too. Um, but, you know, today's day and age, as, as you're going to see, uh, most of the marine engines are, are literally right off the car line. Uh, all the LS, LT stuff are literally the same RPOs as uh, what, what a Chevy truck would have. But the industry is making a move to outboards. You know, we have a lot of center console boats today. Um, you know, the traditional IO inboard uh, design is kind of going by the wayside, you know. Uh, so kind of what 
what we do here, I'm sure not a lot of us do outboard power heads. I know I don't, we do some, um, but our focus today is inboard and IO. So traditional Chevy, Chrysler, that kind of stuff. Wanna identify popular engines. Uh, I wanna talk about installation configurations. Okay, there's V drives where the engine's in backwards. Um, I, I just wanna to touch on that a little bit. Um, identify popular inboard opposite rotation engines. Okay, I know this is the elephant in the room, okay? Um, we're going to discuss that, why that's that way, why they even did that, okay? Um, we're going to talk about component differences. We're going to name names on some part sources, stuff I, I've had great luck with. Uh, we're going to talk about some common machine shop mistakes that we see here. And we're going to talk about some installer mistakes. You know, the job's only as good. We could have the best process in the world. We could have the Rottler H85AX Hone. We could have Blake Speed, everybody tell us. We could have profilometers. We can have everything, okay? But if the installer doesn't do his job correct, everything we did is you for nothing, okay? So we gotta work with our installer a little bit too. So why should you consider the marine market? You know, this is just me, I, I, I've always liked boats, okay? But obviously you gotta be near some type of water source, right? It's mostly GM engines. I, I would probably say that most of us are pretty familiar with General Motors engines. So it's most of it is stuff we already know. There's hardly any competition in this stuff. I know around here we've got a half a dozen, or I have four really good engine builders in our area, okay, in the two cities, and it's just us four. And 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 I'll I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you, you know, in Port Clinton here where I'm located, I, I should probably say where I'm at. Um, I'm on the western basin of Lake Erie, um, and we are the largest concentration of freshwater boating, okay, is is right here, right where I live, and in one harbor. In, in our town in Port Clinton, there are over 10,000 registered boats, okay? So just think of all the service work, engine work, and everything that's done. That doesn't count everybody's private home, everything else. So, you know, Lake Erie is, is, is awesome boating. So, um, so, like I say, there's not a lot of competition, you know? Uh, part sources are trickier. I, I know we all get beat up on Amazon and online sources and that, um, but that, that's always a plus. And I believe there's excellent markup percentage. You know, I'm going to share some things on what we do here. Um, we're going to talk about the sea trial actually uh, in part two, um, but but don't be afraid to charge for this stuff. You know, I, I charge for sea trials. It's it's on the bill. I charge 300 bucks, right? Our shop right here is $150 an hour. And uh, obviously most of the stuff we're doing is local to us and that gets billed and that's paid before the engine leaves the shop, you know, and it's up to the customer or the, or the uh, installing dealer to inform me that the boat is ready for sea trial. And if they if I don't go on the sea trial, the warranties no, there is none. Okay, and and we'll talk about that. So it's just like any other niche market, right? You know, I, I'm sure a lot of you guys do race engines or or farm or ag or whatever. But you know, boating is a demanding season, especially where we're at. You know, our season is so short. You know, up here in, in northern Ohio, you know, we might get four months of boating. You know, maybe five. You know. Uh, you know, you figure school doesn't get out till June. So a lot of people boating doesn't really happen till middle of June. You got July, August, kids are back to school. And that's when the boating season already starts to dip. At least that's how it works here. I'm sure we've got people in Florida and all over the world. Your season might be a little different, but I'm just talking from how our season is here. So, but you know what? I, I'm going to venture to say that most of us aren't boaters. Okay. So when you're not a boater, maybe you're not totally into marine engines and so forth. But I, I feel there's some things that I'm gonna share that we need to know to make sure we're successful in what we're doing. So here's my challenges to this industry, right? We're not a boater, kind of like what I just said, right? So you're not interested in boats, right? We're engine builders, most of us, right? So we're into some type of racing, motorsports. So we connect with racers generally, right? You go to the racetrack, you're on these Facebook groups and so forth. I venture to say most engine builders aren't on a C Ray Facebook group or something like that. They probably don't anything, know anything about boats. And that's okay, you know. Um, like I say, our season's very short. You know, salt water is another thing. Uh, you know, most of the stuff in salt water is getting thrown away. You know, we're not, you're not rebuilding a lot of salt water stuff, you know. And that's our joke here. We get a salt water special up north, right? They buy a boat in Florida, it's cheap. Bring it up here, it's a disaster. You know, you can't get the bolts out, everything's rusted off, it's a pain. Okay. I'm going to say 90% of us are just doing partial jobs, right? Most most of us are probably just doing long blocks, right? And we're hoping and praying that the installing dealer or boat owner 
is checking that distributor, checking those injectors, checking, make sure all that stuff's right. Okay. And we're going to go over all that because that's where all the problems lie. You know, I'm not saying engine builders don't make mistakes. You know, we make mistakes, including myself, but most of these failures is right here. You know, this stuff. Um, when we get to the newer stuff, this poses another challenge because, you know, right now in the automotive industry, we have the right to repair act right, which is where GM, Ford, Chrysler, Kia, Hyundai, whatever you want to call them, um, they have to give up the information. We can get the scan tools. We can get the um, service information. Uh, we can buy all that stuff. Well, on off-highway stuff, um, this is a challenge, right? You know, Mercury has a tool called the G3. It's their scanner. You have to be a dealer to get it, okay? There's no if ands, buts about it. Volvo Penna, they have Vodia, okay, which is their tool. You got to be a Volvo dealer and you actually have to attend training to be able to get it. So even if you are a dealer, they don't turn it on until you actually go to a physical online class. That's pretty difficult if I'm an independent marina or I'm an engine builder, right? I, I'm, I'm hoping and praying I've got a trained technician on the other end that can read data, you know? So, and like I said, the scan tool, that, that's a little bit of a challenge. And I, I'll show you, I got some ways around that, not all, but some. Um, but again, you know, AERA, we can help. Um, I, I've, I've uploaded a bunch of manuals and stuff to the AERA uh, for everything and uh, mostly for older stuff. So don't hesitate to call the tech line and get a hold of Rob and, and Chuck in the technical department. The, these guys are good. They'll help you. So first thing, uh, one of the things I want to cover, I should say, is, is a, a boat, right? I, I assume most of us aren't boaters here, but we need to be, we need to get comfortable with the terms, okay? So when we talk about the starboard side, uh, that's what we, we, some would call the right side of the boat, right? The helm is the steering, okay? That's generally on the starboard side of the boat. And we're gonna explain why here in a second. But, um, so when we talk about a port engine, here's how I remember port and starboard, okay? Left has four letters and so does port. So port to me is left, okay? So, um, and obviously we have the, the fore and aft or the transom, uh, which is the rear of the boat, the bow is the front tip. So. I just want to go over some terms. So when I say starboard and port, if you're not a boater, you know exactly what I'm saying. Okay. Generally speaking, okay, most boats turn a right-hand propeller, single screw boats, all right, specifically. And the reason uh, for that, uh, I'm going to get to here in a second, but uh, is, is the boat will want to come up on the starboard side. If that prop is turning right hand, I'm going to have a counteracting force, and that's what the driver uh, of the vessel, uh, generally, hopefully he's sitting in the seat, you know, is going to help counteract that. And obviously a twin screw boat, the water always, easy way to remember this, is the water always goes away from the boat. So this is the transom here. So let's say I'm standing in the parking lot looking at this boat. It's on a trailer. This is the starboard side. Starboard side's always going to turn a right-hand propeller, okay? The port side, left is always going to turn a left-hand propeller, okay? So, uh, like I say, just keep that in mind. This little 26-foot Chris Craft launch, I just use this as a uh, illustration here. So I put this little arrow because just if we, we can pretend we're on plane on this thing, all right, this, this boat actually has an 8.1 liter engine we rebuilt last year, okay? Uh, 420 horse, it's a GI, GXI, we'll talk about that a little later, but you know, the helm situation right here, the driver's sitting right here. So when this thing's up on plane under power, this boat is going to want to rise a little bit on the starboard side. Okay. That's why we have the driver's weight. Like I say, most generally, you know, the, the, the driver, the captain of the vessel is going to be on the starboard side. So that's why we have a right hand prop. Okay. Let's talk about rotation. So now that we know why, what prop has to spin, what direction, what for, you know, that, that leads us into our engine discussion, all right? So when we look at engine rotation in the marine world, we always look at the flywheel, okay? The flywheel always determines rotation. So when I say I have a left-hand rotation engine, okay, I'm looking at the flywheel. And when I mean this, I'm talking a traditional engine, a traditional engine that the flywheel is mounted to the transmission. Now we have exceptions to that, which I'm gonna cover. Uh, but for ease of discussion right now, this is a left-hand engine, okay? It's spinning left-hand, but this is the automotive rotation engine because it spins clockwise from the front, okay? 
So standard rotation, automotive rotation, those are common terms, okay? But when we get to opposite rotation or right-hand rotation, obviously that's opposite, okay? Flywheel is turning to the right, all right? And the harmonic balancer in this case is turning to the left. This would be an opposite or right-hand engine. Uh, I'm, I refer to it as a right-hand rotation engine and a left-hand rotation engine, okay? So right-hand rotation engine in my world is an opposite rotation engine, all right? Opposite automotive. And that's why I put this bullet point here. This is very important, right? Engine rotation is determined by direction of the flywheel, all right? We don't use prop rotation to determine engine rotation. I want to repeat that. We do not use prop rotation to determine engine rotation. So in other words, even though on this previous slide here, I could have a right-hand prop, that does not necessarily mean I have a right-hand rotation engine here. So. Uh, we'll talk about how to identify that, all right? Same basic thing here. This is just a picture showing left-hand rotation, all right? So there's two transmissions out there. Actually, there's three. But we're going to talk about two ratios here that are pretty unique that I need to cover, in my opinion. There's a cast iron velvet drive, 191, and a 188 to 1, okay? And these are reversing ratios. All right, I know this is gonna be a little confusing, but I wanna cover this because I can't tell you how many times I've seen engines installed in the wrong spot. This happens more time than I care to admit. All right, because guys, they're, they're, you know, the, the marine technician or the builder or whatever, they're looking at the crankshaft rotation. They're not paying attention to what's going on elsewhere, okay? So believe it or not, if I have this ratio transmission, either of these two, that means that my opposite or right-hand rotation engine would be on the port side of the vessel. Okay, generally speaking, the right hand rotation engine is on the starboard side if it doesn't have this ratio transmission. Okay, these two ratios 188 191. They don't really make these past 1992. This is mostly older boats, but I, I venture to say here in freshwater, we work on a lot of old stuff. Now, if I'm in Fort Lauderdale, I'm not working on any of this stuff. This stuff wouldn't last the salt, it's, it's all over. So I realize we have a, a, a varying group of people here, so I'm trying to cover all aspects. I know some of this might be older, but I, I see this all the time. And this is confusing because the people, like I say, all this talent that knows this, they're, they're rapidly disappearing from this industry. So I definitely want to cover this. And like I say, most boats spin a right-hand propeller, single screw, but there's always exceptions. A lot of ski boats uh, turn left-hand props, okay? They have ballast tanks. Uh, they're trying to make weight, different situation. But some popular manufacturers are Malibu, Ski Natees, Mastercrafts. Um, these these boats here are upwards of two, three hundred thousand dollars now. If you want to buy a new one, you know they're, they're not cheap, uh, and they're popular. But like I say, most of the time the starboard side is going to be our opposite rotation engine. Okay. So most inboard boats, 1994 and up. I say most. Um, that's when GM stopped producing opposite rotation engines there are a few stragglers crusader did make some gen 5 454s which we'll talk about uh that were opposite rotation and marine power actually did some gen 6 stuff opposite rotation um but when we went to this aluminum transmission which we're going to talk more about transmissions on part two uh both engines rotate the same okay but they both have to rotate left hand so that means both engines are left hand rotation automotive rotation and now the switching is done in the transmission, which years ago, I wish this would have happened. It'd taken a lot of confusion out of marine work. But when you start to deal with, you know, mid 90s and up, you start not have to worry about if the engine's opposite rotation. That's my point here. So, and same thing, you know, right hand prop on the starboard side, left hand prop on the port side. Okay. And this configuration here is a V drive configuration, which means the engines are installed backwards. So the flywheel you can see is towards the bow of the boat, all right, uh, on both sides. And, and I'll tell you why they do that in a minute or why boat builders like to do it. Um, but a, a normal traditional inboard is just like this. The flywheel is coupled, uh, is towards the uh, stern of the boat or, or the transom uh, and, and the shaft goes right through here. We're talking strictly inboard stuff here. We'll jump into inboard outboards okay this was and i kind of say that past tense a very popular configuration for many years you know stern drive market is is pretty much evaporated 
you know, that there's still a few stern drive boats being made here in 2024. We're pretty much all outboard, but for quite a few years, this was a very, very popular configuration, right? Engines inside the boat. This is the transom. Out drive mounts in to the engine to a coupler, right? We got hydraulics in here. We have trim. This happens to be a Volvo 81 with a Volvo dual prop DP uh, drive, okay? Very popular configuration. Engines mounted right at the back, right at the transom. Was, boat builders loved it because everything, the drivetrain stayed to the rear of the vessel. They could, you know, utilize floor space, cabin space, that kind of stuff. You know, when you got an inboard boat like what we got here, these engines are up in the boat, right? So boat builders have issues there, right? So you have you don't have as much cabin space. You, know, you figure all this stuff back here, you're not putting a bed next to the shafts, right? You know, <laughs> so the berths and, and bathroom and everything else is going to be up here. So uh, that that's why boat builders use these different configurations. But I just want you familiar, and you can bet on it here. Any IO engine is automotive or left-hand rotation. I personally have never seen an opposite rotation inboard outboard. Okay, the the the, the prop change is, or excuse me, the, the prop rotation change is always done in the outdrive. Okay, sometimes there's a special lower unit that does it. Sometimes if it's like a Bravo, like a Mercury or a Volvo, it's just a shift cable uh, swap. You know, it, it pulls instead of pushes. Okay, um, but this is an outdrive class, but I just want you to be, you know, uh, uh, I, I want you to, to have an idea what we're talking about here. When somebody says they have an IO and, and what to expect as far as rotation. So somebody calls me up and says, hey, Chris, I've got a 7.4 Bravo. Uh, I want a price on overhaul. I know exactly what I'm dealing with, right? I know it's left-hand rotation. I don't have to worry about you know, ops rotation. This is a V-drive configuration, okay, with a cast iron uh, style transmission. Prop shaft goes under the boat. Okay, under the boat, just like that. This is for room because you figure everything from here forward is I can I can do anything I want, you know. So all the weights back here, the engine's installed backwards, the exhaust manifolds are turned around. Um, we'll talk more about transmissions in part two uh, on on these velvet drives, but obviously the to go in forward, that shifter has to go towards the engine. Okay. Uh, you cannot reverse rotation in the cast iron transmissions. We will talk more about that in May, an upcoming May seminar. Um, this is traditional eight degree down angle, all right? I definitely want to mention this. If, if you've done any marine engines, you've noticed probably in the 1980s with traditional inboards that there was always a different oil pan, most generally, okay? An aluminum, a cast aluminum pan, eight quarts, nine quarts of oil. This is why, this engine's on an angle, okay? So if I had the traditional car five, six quart oil pan, you know, I, I don't necessarily have the amount of oil I want and the position I want, you know. Um, in later years, when they went to the aluminum transmissions, the engine now pretty much sits level in the boat. And that's why you'll see, for instance, on Gen 6 454s, they're using a steel pan, you know, on, on later engines, you know. But in the old days, you know, it, it was cast aluminum, big, thick, heavy pan, okay a lot more oil. Same thing with the V-drive configuration. This is a newer style V-drive configuration where the shaft goes through the entire transmission. This output shaft is hollow and the shaft comes right through in the couplers right here. So to pull this engine out of the boat, you got to pull the water, you got to, you got to pull the boat out of the water. Not an easy proposition, right? So that means the rudder's got to be dropped in most cases, props got to come off and the shaft's got to come out and then they take the engine and transmission out together. Okay. So not, not so easy in most boats. This is an old school cast iron V-drive, okay? Similar situation, okay? Engines in the back. Again, they do it because it has more cabin space, right? I can keep all this engine and stuff to the rear of the boat. Uh, I, can, I can use more of the boat for boating stuff, beds, kitchen, you name it, okay? Bigger stuff. Most of the time, V-drives are bigger boats. There are some ski boats that are V-drive, okay? Uh, but most of the time we're talking, you know, 30s and up. You know, Sea Ray made a Sundancer that was a very popular V drive configuration boat. This is a Walters V drive. This is a 7.4 uh, Gen 5 engine we just did over the winter. Um, these aren't too popular, but they're out there. Okay. So this uses a traditional 1018. I know you may or may not know what that is. Uh, transmission, just a one to one transmission. And it's got this uh, V drive assembly with two U-joints in here. 
I can change rotation inside this V drive, right? I can put an idler gear in here. So that means I could have a right hand or opposite rotation engine here, or I could have a left hand, or I could have two left hands and have one V drive configuration set up for left hand and the other one for right hand. So I can't always, like I say, I can't always go by what the prop's doing. That doesn't tell me what the engine's doing, okay? Uh, this happens to be a Silverton. This was a 1993 Silverton 34 Express twin engine boat. Here's my configuration, right? Cutlass bearing, shaft going through the bottom of the boat. You know, the alignment is critical here. I'm hoping our installers, when they put our engines in, that they're checking the alignment. That's one thing I verify when I go on a sea trial, which we'll talk about more in part two. Um, and you can see how much of an angle this engine is in, in a traditional inboard situation. Okay, that's why the oil pan and pickup screen is different. You'll see when we get to Chrysler's, they, some of them actually use a floating pickup. They actually had the pickup screen float in the oil, okay? So let's go with this elephant in the room, all right? We, we got an idea. I wanna start with what, you know, configurations of boats so we knew what we were dealing with, but this leads me to this, okay? Opposite rotation engines and flywheel forward. Why? Why would they do this? You know, if you're an engine builder, you're thinking, why would they give me this kind of pain? Okay, our job's hard enough as it is, and all of a sudden I got this problem. Well, let's let's take a look at these one by one. All right, many boats are single engine. Okay, so it's easier to achieve that right hand prop rotation. Now think years ago, we didn't have those aluminum ZF and and Velvet Drive 5000 series transmissions that came out in the 1990s that could switch rotation with an automotive flywheel rotating engine. You know, we didn't have that. Okay, all we have was these cast iron velvet drive transmissions that couldn't do that except one ratio, right? 188 or 191. Twin engine boats, we got to have opposing prop, right? I, I can't have two props going the same way. You know, the boat's going to do this number. If I have two right hand uh, props, that boat's not going to handle right, right? That's why the water has to be opposing. So I have to have one engine one way and one the other, okay? Years ago, if you've been around quite a while or you work on a lot of old stuff like we seem to, flywheel forward was a mainstay. So that's where the engines installed backwards, right? The flywheel's out front, pain in the butt to time. They, they usually don't have timing marks. We're going to get into that to set the ignition timing, um, you know, but there's a couple reasons they did this. You know, number one, we could use an automotive rotation engine, right? If I turn that engine around backwards, you know, and I drive it off the front of the engine in a car, right? That's right-hand rotation. So right-hand rotation, I can turn that right-hand prop and I don't need to do anything. I don't need a special cam or any of that stuff, okay? And the other big reason they did it is lower center of gravity. So think about it. When you have the flywheel, uh, it, it, when I have the transmission mounted to the flywheel, like would be in a car, you know, that, that engine would have to be higher up in the boat, okay? Well, that changes the center of gravity. If I've only got, you know, a gunwale that's, um, you know, a foot or two off the water line, you know, that boat would be really tipsy. So the lower I put that engine in the boat, the more stability I have as a boat builder, okay? Especially wooden boats. A lot of wooden boats are this way, okay? Um, flywheel forward. And we drive it off the trans or the, the harmonic balance run because that engine sits low, right? When you've got that engine sitting like this, you know, I know this is kind of corny, if this is if this is the front of the engine, you know that that harmonic or that front snout of that crankshaft is already lower in the bilge, so that's why they did it, you know, and that's what makes that that's what sets in some confusion on some of these engines, okay? Because you got flywheel forward, there's different stuff, you know, so we can fit these engines under floors and hatches, you know, a lot of crisscrafts. We're going to talk about the Q model. OK, they actually made uh, flywheel forward engines in the 1970s. All right. And they fit under floors. All right. Um, and again, smaller or most boats use automotive rotation engines with a flywheel forward. Most boats were single screw back then. We didn't have a ton of twin engine boats in the 1940s and 50s and even 60s. Right. Most of these things are 15, 16, 18, 19, 20, 23 foot. You know, were there twin screw boats back then? Absolutely. But the. The vast majority, you know, you got to think of middle class boaters, like what Chris Craft, for instance, catered to Lyman, you know, big popular boat names around here, Wooden, you know, Richardson's, you know, they catered to Joe Average Boater. OK, not everybody was a movie star and had a 50 foot wooden Chris Craft, you know what I'm saying? So and I state this again, most engines past 1994 aren't opposite rotation, you know, uh, the transmission handles. There are a few exceptions and we're going to deal with those. 
okay, but most. I want to talk about piston orientation. Okay, so while we're on the subject of opposite rotation engines, one of the key points that may or may not have to be done in some opinions is we always, well, I shouldn't say we always, most of the time we have a piston pin offset. Okay, because we have the major thrust surface and we have the minor thrust surface. All right, well, on an automotive rotation engine, all right, the major thrust surface on the, I'll call it the port bank, is going to be towards the intake manifold. All right. Uh, I think that's if you can picture it in a car, I, I know you know what I'm talking about. But this thrust surface, right, we have an offset in this pin. And the theory here is the short side of the piston, okay, or the offset, the short side of the offset is going to go towards the major thrust side. And one of the main reasons they do this is for noise, okay. Engine manufacturers spend a lot of time, spend a lot of money doing research all the way back, okay. And not every piston has a, an offset like Okay, but a lot of them do, all right? If your piston has an F or marked front or has a notch in it, you can bet that it has a slight piston pin offset, all right? But it's there for noise, okay? Now, I know this is a, a contentious argument sometimes because I, I see some engines uh, that you can buy online or elsewhere, and, and, and believe it or not, there's engines from the factory that I have taken apart that do not have the pistons turned around the correct way for the rotation okay is it a big big deal no i don't think it's a huge deal should it be done yes that's a chris's opinion i think it should be right but i just took apart a 454 that was virgin and it was right hand rotation opposite rotation and the notches were towards the front you know it ran just fine the, the engines of 1987 you know ran all these years so um so if I bought an engine and was wrong, would I change it? If I knew it, probably not. You know, um, if I could change it easily, yes, I would. But I wanted to just describe what this thrust is and why it's different, okay? Because when you look at a piston, it normally says front or F or something like that or not. Well, in an opposite rotation engine, the front is gonna face the flywheel, okay? because the thrust is reversed, okay? On the port side, the thrust is gonna to be towards the exhaust manifold side, okay? So here we go. You know, obviously when I have forces on this piston, when we have an explosion, a combustion event, you know, this is gonna be the major thrust side when this crankshaft is turning this direction, okay? Obviously we're looking at this from the front of the engine, which normally, like I said, marine, we're always looking at the flywheel end, but you can humor me and, and pretend here. So this is the major thrust side. So the short side of the pin is gonna be right here, all right? This is another picture of the offset, okay? And like I said, I've got all this stuff in your handout. Download this link. I, I put all this together so you'd have it. I know this might be a lot. Some of you guys aren't engine builders. I know we got people from all over. You know, this might be something that would be, uh, you know, hard to kind of grasp or which way should it go. Um, like I say, as the piston goes down, that's where most of the wear is. You know, for years we've had uh, connecting rods that had squirters or holes. And like, for instance, Chrysler's, you know, they squirt oil onto that cylinder wall to help that major thrust surface, right? Help lubricate it. You know, there's so much force going against that piston right there. So that's why sometimes the squirters are there, okay, to help lube uh, that thrust surface. So this happens to be a Chrysler engine, okay? This is an opposite rotation engine, all right? I know these pistons are dirty, but you can see that notch right there, okay? That notch is towards the flywheel. I, I left this picture on purpose so you can see the harmonic balancer, all right? So that, that surface right there, that's facing the rear of the engine. That is set up for opposite rotation, okay? Now you can see this piston does have four valve reliefs, okay? So that means this piston, you know, I, I would have no problem turning this around, you know? So, but built, this is an opposite rotation engine, um, that, that's key, okay? Like I say, is it completely mission critical? No, it's not. Should it be done? Yes, I mean, I would, <laughs> sorry. I know that's loaded and I didn't really answer your question, but you, you get the, I don't want you to freak out if you buy something if the pistons aren't right, that, oh my God, this thing's gonna blow up, it's gonna be a disaster, it's gonna be noisy. I personally haven't heard any weird noises from pistons that have been backwards. Uh, I know that might be a question we might get, right, Chris, is it really noisy? I personally haven't heard it. Um, there's YouTube videos out there uh, that the folks have actually done the bank to bank swap 
and see if there's a horsepower gain. Uh, there, according to them, there wasn't um, just because of, of the piston pin offset, but I just want that out there so you know what I'm talking about. So this is set up for opposite. This lovely girl, this is another story, okay? This, somebody installed the wrong rotation engine, all right? Uh, and uh, it was actually sucking water into the vessel because somebody went off the propeller rotation, okay? This engine had a 191 transmission. This guy ordered a long block from whoever, doesn't matter who it is, because it's not the builder's fault. And you can see that the back two cylinders had water sitting on it, okay? So what happens is when we're spinning this engine the wrong direction, the exhaust is now the intake. And guess what the exhaust is hooked to? The water, right? They put the boat in water and it just pumped water right in this engine. Okay, and it actually been a connecting rod on a brand new engine, okay? But the point here is the piston notches are to the front. That's why I use this picture, okay? So this is set up for opposite, or excuse me, for standard rotation. And you can see this engine never ran. Look at how, look at how clean these pistons are and how rusty those cylinder walls are. This thing never popped once. They screwed around. Believe it or not, the story, this is six years. It's hard to believe, but this, this engine was in this boat for six years. Nobody could get it running. I, I, it's hard to believe, but at any rate, piston notches to the front, standard rotation. This is flywheel forward. This is an old Lyman. I know this is antique. You're probably laughing and smirking, but this is a Continental F226 base engine. Okay, it's 1956, I believe, 18 footer. And the flywheel is up here. I know you can't see it, but this gunwale, this boat is maybe two foot. Okay. So if I had this flywheel in hooked to the transmission, this engine would be much, much higher in the boat, which would make it kind of more unstable. So that's why the transmission in this case is driven off the, the front, so to speak, of the engine. So I just want to put that out there. Again, mostly older boats. If you're doing a lot of, I'm sure we got some guys on here that do a lot of older boat restorations. You're working on a lot of Chris Crafts and Rivas and all sorts of stuff. You know, this is key, right? And this is why they did this, right? We want to keep that engine low in the boat. And you don't have an engine hatch. It's like World Trade Center, you know? Who wants to have a boat that's got an engine hatch that's higher than the gun roll or the side, you know? So the, the, the lower we can keep that engine, the lower the engine hatch, the more room we have more comfortable for the operator of the boat and the, and the people enjoying the boat. This happens to be a 1955 Chrysler Crown, all right? And it's an M47S, and this is a 265 cubic inch uh, flathead Chrysler 6. And uh, this is an engine we just did over the winter, and there's a point I want to hit home here, all right? This engine's pretty much the same as, as a vehicle, in my opinion. Okay, there's a couple differences. This thing has uh, 7 16 exhaust guides, uh, sodium filled, which was a marine industrial thing only, um, which are very hard to come by. Uh, normally, what you could do is drive those exhaust guides out and put regular 3 8 guides in and valves uh, because you, I don't think you can buy new sodium valves anymore. But anyway, that, that's another discussion. The, the, main, the main thing I'm here is this crankshaft snout. Okay, it's a little hard to see in my picture but there's a little orifice right where my red laser pointer is, all right? And that little orifice is an oiling hole. And this is mission critical. So this crankshaft is actually drilled on the number one main, okay? It's drilled right th down through, and then where the harmonic balance or bolt would go, that is drilled, okay? And this is a 65 thousandths orifice in this, um, in this plug here. And that's there to lube the transmission. These older engines had mechanical gears and it needs that oil to lube that front bearing. And if I don't have that oil, I ruin the transmission probably on the C trial. So we, again, we could have the best engine, best paint, best everything. And let's say this crankshaft is deemed to be non-salvageable and we go to a junkyard and get a 1949 Chrysler town and country, whatever, 265 engine. And I take that crankshaft core and this is what's tricky. This, the, the casting numbers and everything on this stuff are going to be identical. So you're going to compare the casting number, you're going to compare the stroke or whatever and go, hot damn, we got the right crank, right? You don't pay attention to this. You do this beautiful engine overhaul, put it back in this nice, beautiful, show winning wood quality boat and dunzo on the transmission. I've seen it more times than I care to admit. And this is why I'm covering this. I, I know not all of us do older stuff, but this is a key point, okay? And this is right out of the service manual, okay? And it tells me, hey, Chris, there's a drill plug threaded into the rear end of the crankshaft. Now they call it the rear, because that's the rear of the engine, but to us, it's the front. 
and it directs oil to the reverse gear. Okay, that is so important. Almost all of these engines have this. When you have a six owner flywheel forward, four owner flywheel forward, even some V8283s, which we'll get to here in a second, we have to have this thing drilled. This happens to be a gray marine. Okay, this is a Continental 226. There's a bolt. I know it's hard to see. There's a bolt. The bolt has a hole in it. Okay, and here's another point I want to hit home. A lot of us use two jaw pullers. This hub is pressed on to the crankshaft. Okay, it's got two keyways, all right, because this is driving the boat. Okay, this guy right here, and that's the other thing with these flywheel forward engines, you know, the keyway that's normally meant to drive, you know, just to hold the harmonic balancer in time, that keyway is now in charge of driving the boat. So this thing is not a slip fit. Okay, all right, so we're on this Continental engine here, and we got this bolt, all right, it's got this hole, and this is pressed on. And I tell you, another I'm going to use the word rookie here, rookie mistake, right? As we get our two jaw puller out, we want to pull on this thing. Well, if I take my threaded end of my puller and I press against that bolt, okay, because I know a lot of guys do, right? They back that bolt off a little bit and then they want to try to get that balancer off, right? We're too lazy to go get the right equipment. Well, we can smash that hole. Let's say, you know, when you take, when you take engines apart, they're suntan as I like to call it, right? When you look at timing gears and this thing, you know, this thing's dark. It's full of 50 years of oil, grime, grease. I may not necessarily know that there's a hole there. You know what I mean? Because when I take this thing out, this thing's usually just full of junk. Okay. So it's my first day in the job. Boss man, right? We give the teardown stuff right to the new guys. And this is where we kind of get in trouble sometimes, right? New guy doesn't know anything about this. He starts ripping this stuff apart, right? Well, he gets his two jaw puller in here. We're going to go to town and we take our two jaw puller and we ram up against this bolt. We just close that hole off. OK, because we, we sat there with our impact and we hammered, br, 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 we blasted that thing out of there. We got it loose. Nobody pays attention, right? Because all of us have built engines probably for many years. We've never seen a, a harmonic balancer bolt, as I'll call it, with a hole in it. All right. So now I just closed off that hole. So I do this best as rebuilding the whole wide world, put that bolt back in, shift the engine back. Maybe I start it up in our shop or it goes to the, the, the boat uh, restoration place and they fix it. And all of a sudden I got transmission problems you know, shortly thereafter. And that would be the engine builder's fault. You know, you would think transmission, ah, oh, it's 60, 70 years old. It's just junk old transmission. You know, I'll be honest with you. These Paragon and Capital gears that are on these old engines, these things are great. They hardly fail. They hardly fail. Uh, not a lot of horsepower here. This is not a, a an Apache or cigarette racing, but it's 100 horse, right? 60 horse. We don't have a lot of, we don't have a lot of horsepower here. I mean, so, you know, these transmissions are very robust. So, but I just want to make that point here. Don't get wound up with your two jaw puller. That hub is pressed on hard, okay? And it's pressed on hard for a reason. It's driving, you got to keep that key. We don't want any clearance there. This is that Paragon transmission on this old gray. You can see it's a mechanical style gearbox. I got to lube that input shaft, okay? That oil squirts right in there. I know this isn't a transmission rebuilding class, but if I think an engine issue can handle or could affect a transmission, I'm going to tell you about it, you know, because again, a lot of us, if we, if you've been around for a while, you know, we've worked on 226s and, and forklifts and all kinds of stuff that doesn't have this issue, right? So we could be the best continental engine builder in the world or best Hercules builder in the world. But all of a sudden we think, oh yeah, that's just a regular Hercules. These are the differences. And this is the stuff that'll kick our ass. Okay. And, and trust me, and you wouldn't know because here's how this goes down. You rebuild the engine. Put the transmission back on guy takes the boat out runs it a couple hours smokes the transmission all right these aren't the easiest things in the world to find parts for trust me okay so you find used parts or whatever you get the transmission fixed put it back in you're thinking oh it's just old something happened we didn't touch it he puts it back in two two hours later it's junk again okay now what okay and now you wouldn't think that that oiling problem or we subbed a crankshaft in a core crankshaft that doesn't have that drill in there okay now we got to take the whole engine back out of the boat. Now this is a disaster. Okay. So I'm hoping these slides save somebody. Okay. That, that, that's my hope. Let's go to something a little newer. I, I started off with some old stuff. I don't want to bore you to death with it, but um, here, here's when I say newer, we're talking early sixties now, late fifties, early sixties. This is a 185 horse Chris craft. Um, it's a 283 base engine. All right. And it has a mechanical, Paragon 25XE transmission. Okay, there's not a quiz at the end, so you don't have to worry about all the, the, the actual terms. But um, this transmission also needs rifle drill. 
okay, uh, through the crankshaft, all right? Newer engines had HF7 gears, HF3 paragons, um, hydraulic transmissions, that is not required. But this mechanical gear, if you've got this aluminum cover like this, it's a mechanical transmission. It needs lube, okay, right here. This little lever here, this is just a snap in, snap off, this little cover, all right? You can see this is a flywheel forward engine, okay? This is bolted to the transmission end, all right? And here's a good document. This is why I want you to download this PDF, okay? Here is a Chris Craft drawing on how to drill this crankshaft, all right? And uh, it, it's a drawing, it's very important. It tells you the size, the hole, the bolt. There's two reasons why I wanna cover this. Some of us want 350s, right? Some, you know, all of our customers, it seems like, I hate to stereotype them, but a lot of customers, they want more power. They want a 350, right? Ah, 283, ah, I don't want that, right? I, I want more power, you know, bigger is always better. So it's a common practice to sub in a 350 engine, okay? Well. A 350 Chris Craft engine uh, was never used with a mechanical 25 XE Paragon transmission. So you're thinking, ah, it's just a VH Chevy. This is no big deal. I'll get the rotation right. I'll order an engine from wherever. I'll build an engine from wherever, right? I got enough small block Chevy stuff around here. Hot dog. I'm going to build you an engine, Mr. Customer. We're going to get rid of that junk 283. That's old, wore out stuff. We're going to build this 350, right? You don't do this. He's got that transmission. His transmission is going to blow up on a seat trail. Trust Okay, so take this document. You got to do this. And here's the other caveat. Okay, the early 283s, if you're a sharp GM guy, the, the crank bolt was 3 8 right? It's 3 8 24, right? We know the more modern Chevys are 7 16 20, all right? So guess what? I can't use that bolt, right? Because that the original 283 bolt, if I had it, it was going to be 3 8 right? So I got to now modify the original, or not the original, I got to modify a 7 16 bolt. So you use like a Pioneer bolt kit, for instance. Uh, that's what I do here. Um, I take the Pioneer uh, 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 GM small block bolt kit. Uh, I can't use that washer. It's a real thick washer that goes in there. So I can't use the washer that comes with it. Um, but I actually drill that bolt. And you build, basically drill that eighth inch I will tell you, it says metered hole. You should measure the old one. It's about 62,000, it's about a 16th of an inch. Um, it's eighth inch through here, and then you got the metered hole. But you can see here where this is drilled. There's the keyways. Okay, you can see the cross section. We just want to hit that cross section where it goes to the rod pin. Okay, this is gold, guys. This is gold right here. I mean, if this is the only thing you get out of this presentation, in my opinion, you won. Because I'm sure there's people sitting in this room like, oh my God, this, you know, or maybe you hopefully you just didn't build an engine for this. Again, this is not super popular, okay, but it's out there. And this is the stuff that kicks our butts, okay. And I don't want anybody in this room or anything in this in this class to get their butt kicked, okay. So this is why I'm bringing this over. And like I say, 350 is a common swap, all right. Mechanical transmissions. If I got a hydraulic transmission that has its own separate, uh, hydraulic transmission fluid, you know, use a regular ATF, I don't have to worry about this. But as an engine builder, I need to know what this guy's doing, right? If I'm not necessarily doing the whole job, right? If I'm only getting the long block, it's up to, you know, I got to ask questions to the boat and, and the boat owner may not know this, okay? And unfortunately, all these guys that worked on all these old boats in the 50s and 60s, they're, they're drying up, right? So, you know, grandpa's boat or something been laying in the barn for all these years, all of a sudden the kids want to, you know, grandpa's passed on and they want to go run the boat, right? They want to relive old times. And the, the engine's been sitting around for 20, 30 years. It's tied up. Uh, we're not going to put any money to that 283. You swap the 350 in there. Here you go. You think you're doing the guy a favor? You just ruined the transmission. I mean, and again, parts are very difficult to find for these. Internal, very difficult. There's a needle bearing in there. That's the first thing that'll go. That needle bearing explodes. It's a nightmare. It's a nightmare, okay? I don't want that nightmare for you guys. So basically my long-winded point here, you're working on it. If you're trying to build a 185 horsepower Chris Craft 283 Chevy with this mechanical transmission, you've got to drill that crankshaft. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta. Moving on, the Q, all right? These, this, this engine to the left here, uh, the Q, this happens to be a 350 Q, all right? They made these through the middle 1970s, all right? Um, this is a flywheel forward design, all right? 
it had the hydraulic transmission. The Qs that I always saw always had an HF7 style uh, transmission. So you don't have to worry about the crankshaft drilling on this new of an engine, okay? I'm talking the old stuff. Um, but these are unique, okay? They're kind of a headache. They're out there. I'm not saying everybody's gonna see one of these. I know anybody in the salt states or anywhere near that, these, these things are long gone. But you know, here in freshwater, that we get these things in here every once in a while. And I'm gonna go over some nuances in these things, all right? And this here is a, is a Model K, all right? This is a Hercules uh, QXLD, I believe is what this is. Um, and it's got two carburetors, all right? You can't see them, but it's a flywheel forward design. Just happened to be next to this Q, so I figured I'd make it an honorable mention in our picture. And you can see here, I'll go back, there, there's two water pumps, okay? This is the raw water pump, and then this is the recirculation pump. This thing is rotation specific. It has a brass impeller that is pressed on. So I have to have this right. I may not necessarily, they all look the same, but they aren't the same. So pay attention. If I get two of these in, we got the teardown kid going to town, make sure you mark this stuff, okay? There is a Sherwood number on there. It's five digits with a letter, like a 10390G or something. I'm, I'm just kind of rattling numbers here, um, but that's very, very important. So I, I definitely want to hit that. This is the rear of the engine. This happens to have a velvet drive one-to-one -one cast iron transmission. I'm not worried about the, the pair, or I'm not worried about the oil flow, okay? Um, but I've got this timing cover, okay? This fuel pump is upside down. Doesn't this give you the eerie reminder of a flathead Ford V8, right? They had the pump mounted on the back of the engine. And what used to happen to flathead Ford V8s, right? The push rod used to wear, didn't it, right? Well, guess what happens here? This push rod likes to wear in this operation, right? And it doesn't stroke this pump and I have a drivability problem, all right? So uh, that's a very common thing with this. Here's a place where you get gaskets for this thing, okay? Um, I just looked up online, this is Seaway, uh, Midwest Marine's a good spot. Uh, Henkel, uh, chriscraftparts.com is another excellent source for Chriscraft parts. I've got a slide coming up on them later. Um, but these are the special things that are different on this engine, all right? It uses a shorter than normal Chevy distributor. And it uses a Mallory YL566 AV part number, all right? You can't put a regular Chevy distributor in this. I'll explain later, okay? It's got a special intake manifold. It's cast iron. Here's the other problem with this stupid manifold. If you just drain the motor, all right, you just pull the plugs out of the block and, and the uh, exhaust manifolds, you'll freeze and break this intake manifold you actually have to suck the water out of it or you got to run antifreeze through it. I'll show you that later. Almost every one of these engines that comes into our shop has been welded, almost every one, okay? I don't want this problem to happen to you, right? A lot of us rebuild engines. We might test run them, which we're going to talk about in part two. And you think you got the water drained out and you park it in your cold storage and the guy picks the winter boat engine up in the spring and you got your fresh overhaul, you collect the money, calls you up, says, hey, guess what? I got water in the oil. You're thinking, what? And it was your fault. You know, so we'll get into that. Many unique gaskets on this engine, many, okay? Um, the oil pan gasket is different. This piece right here that goes over the rear main bearing cap is thicker than what comes in a Felpro set. Felpro does not make gaskets for these. And this is the Q specific stuff. See, look at this ugly looking timing cover gasket, okay? This is that timing cover to the block, all right? These are thermostat and check valve gaskets, all right? Um, and the rest of that's in those are manifolds and, and those are uh, end cap gaskets and the special gaskets for the oil filter adapter. All right. So um, these are, like I say, this is not in a Felpro book. All right. So uh, if you're building a Q engine, this is a great add on set. You can use your traditional Chevy upper and lower set or your upper set really uh, and then use this for the bottom end. This push rod I was talking about. Okay. Believe it or not, they're still available. But I want to put in here, it's three eighths diameters. It's skinny. It's not the same size as a regular Chevy V8 push rod. Um, and it's five and a half inches long. Okay. These things like to wear on this tip. All right. So basically, what I'm telling you is if you're getting one of these things to overhaul, measure that thing and replace it. You know, almost always we're replacing them when we're doing them. Okay. And this is the part number. All right. And you can buy it from uh, Mr. Hinkle at chriscraftparts.com. Again, this is not a commercial. Um, this is not a paid advertisement. This is just where I get stuff. Okay, so um, right here's the part numbers for that gasket. It's a special gasket. Yes, could you use RTV? Yes, you could. But this push rod here is specific to this Chris Craft Q. 
they made them in 307, 327, and 350. Okay, this is the same on all the, the cubic inches, all right? This is this ugly looking distributor, all right? This is a traditional Chevy Marine Prestolite distributor, okay? This was taken out of a Crusader engine in the 1980s, all right? This is this Chris Craft Q thing, all right? Look at this. Shorter housing does not have the traditional lockdown clamp, all right? It's got a tab up here, all right, to lock this thing down. It uses a flat cap, 221B cap, right? All right, um, and and there's no getting around this. There's there's no replacement of the distributor. A lot of guys want to go electronic ignition. I know there's some Sierra aftermarket stuff out there. Um, for a while, Mallory made Unilite replacement distributors, um, but there's no getting around this guy. Okay, he's different. All right, I just want you to be aware of that. Again, not a lot of these out there, but you know what? One of these days we might get one of these in our shop and it's gonna kick our butt. Same thing right here, just a better close-up picture of that tab. There's a lockdown clamp that goes right over top of that, all right? And that, that's what locks the distributor and locks the timing, all right? This is that intake manifold I was talking about, right? It's already got a down angle. It's already got a wedge built into it, right? This is marine only. These things are not available anymore. Osco used to make them, BAR used to make them, B-A-R-R. -R. They don't make them anymore. Okay, you freeze this, you're on your own. See this little plug right here? This is a half inch MPT plug, all right? You need to take that plug out and get a suction unit or whatever and suck this out. I, I should have got a better picture of the bottom. There's actually three, I think they're inch and a quarter soft plugs. They need to be brass on the bottom of this, okay? And we've taken these things off the engine. Those soft plugs are laying in the lifter valley and there's a crack running all the way down the side. And now it's cast iron, which is tricky to weld. I'm not a very good welder. Uh, luckily, I know people who are. But right now, this is a weld and fix situation. There's no replacing it. I just want you to be aware of that. I know we're talking older stuff here right now, but you don't want to be the bearer of bad news. Start this engine up, run it. You drain it. You think you're good. You ain't. Okay. Another trick. All right. Firing order number one cylinder on these things in a different location, all right? So basically I'm gonna cut it short and say that number one is where number eight would be normally on a Chevrolet engine, okay? This is the flywheel. We're looking at the port side here, right? Left-hand rotation, all right? And obviously the distributor would be towards the flywheel on this, right? Just like a typical GM, but it's in the front of the engine. And you see their firing order is different, right? Goofy fire 1564278, or excuse me, 1564278 and 1872436.5, right? Stuff I don't expect anybody to memorize. Okay. I will tell you for the sake of your argument, this is not a different cam. It's still a regular traditional Chevy cams on both sides, but it's the location of number one that's different. Okay. And the reason I say that is there is a timing mark in the flywheel that I'm going to come up on. And there's no numbers, right? You're gonna see a hole with an L and you're gonna see a hole with an R. And all you do is fire this engine up and you turn that distributor. And if it's a left-hand rotation engine, you line the pointer up to L and lock it down. And believe it or not, that is four degrees before top dead center. When that when that uh, hole is lined up, that that's your base timing on this thing, okay? So, but the reason I'm putting this out there is if you clamp on a number one, you'll never, the GM number one, Right, which would be right here where number eight, you know, the Chris Crab eight is, you'll never find the timing mark. I don't know how many calls, I don't get too many of them on this anymore, but this is always confusing. This sheet right here will save you. Okay. This is another reason why you need to download this PDF. This is right out of a Chris Craft service manual. Okay. So it's interesting. Okay. And you got to know it, right? Like I said, if you wired it like a Chevy engine, 1843-6572 or 1275-6348, you'll win, okay? You can get it, but you just won't get the timing mark to line up, okay? But this is the Chris Craft way. They numbered, their, this is only on the Q, all right? Here's a picture of that timing cover. There's where the pointer is, okay? And I already told you that. There's a drilled hole in there with a L and a drilled hole with an R. And normally I take like a red marker once this engine's painted up or something, uh, and I mark that, and that's your timing marks. You know, there's no other mark on this thing except that. Not real friendly, okay? But that's just the way they did it. Okay. So we're done with the old stuff. So thanks for bearing with me on that. We're going to jump into stuff that you're probably really interested in.